everybody, I'm Ashley Graham, and this is Pretty Big Deal, where confidence is key. Every episode, I get to pick the brains of brilliant, inspiring, honest, new and old friends who are a pretty big deal. Today, we are talking to the incredible Ariana Huffington. You may know her name from the Huffington Post. In 2016, Ariana left the Huffington Post in order to pursue a new passion, wellness. We have Ariana Huffington here. Thank you so much for coming on Pretty oh, Big Deal. I'm so happy. I love you. Oh, I love you. You So I walked into your home for the Free to Baby event, and you were interviewing Amy Schumer as well. And you were just so inviting. It was immediately you walk in your home, and it's like, it's warmth. It's beautifully decorated. Your sister was so cute. She was barefoot running around. <laughs> <laughs> and it was just it was just a really nice event. And I just feel like that's how you welcome everybody into your home. Well, I love our kind of little thrive tribe of women supporting each other and helping each other along the journey. Yeah. With less stress. It's very important. And I want to talk to you about Thrive, but I think that we have to start with Huffington Post. Yes. And I think that you've conquered so many amazing things in your life. But but what was it about Huffington Post that made you want to start? I had already written a lot of books. I've written a total of 15 books. And in 2005, when I launched the Huffington Post, I could see that the conversation had moved online, mm -hmm. that a lot of people were just having the most important conversations online. And I wanted to make sure that people who wouldn't start their own blog could be part of the conversation. So on the day that we launched the Huffington Post, we had Ellen DeGeneres and Walter Cronkite, who is now dead, and Larry David and Ari Emanuel from WME, and tons of people who would never have blogged. Mm -hmm. So we elevated blogging. And then we added uh, reporting. We won a Pulitzer Prize. We added international editions in 18 countries. And two years into building the Huffington Post, I was by then the divorced mother of two daughters. Mm. I collapsed. You know, I had bought into this delusion that in order to be super mom and super entrepreneur, you just basically didn't have time to take care of yourself. You just didn't have time to sleep or rest or recharge. And uh, so I collapsed. I hit my head on my desk, in the corner of my desk on the way down, broke my cheekbone. <laughs> Your cheekbone? Wait, do you remember the feeling of passing out or do you completely blacked out? I completely blacked out. I literally came to in a pool of my own blood and nobody had shot me. <gasps> Wait, so when you woke up, what was your first reaction? Well, complete disorientation. I didn't really know what had happened. Did you wake up on your own? Or? It was in my, off, in my home office. And so literally my assistant who was upstairs, it's like a two-story right. office, heard the bang and uh, came down. And I was taken to the hospital. And the worst part is that they don't know what's wrong with you. Right. You know, do you have a brain tumor? Do you have a heart problem? So I had this long journey of every test, you know, your MRIs, echocardiograms, et cetera. And at the end of all the tests, I had one doctor who was acting like the mastermind of all the tests. And he is a bit philosophical and sardonic. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and he I said to me, Ariana, there's nothing wrong with you, but there's everything wrong with you. You know, there's nothing the medical profession can do for you. You're suffering from, he called it civilization's disease, burnout. Ooh. And he said, you have to change your life. The World Health Organization has just recognized as a real syndrome. Right. Uh, it's no longer just a phrase we use. It's mm -hmm. real. Uh, it has huge health consequences, and it also has huge mental health consequences, as mm -hmm. we are seeing with the incredible increase in uh, suicide, depression, anxiety, anxiety suicide. Yeah. So were you happy to hear that it was burnout, or were you more 
upset? No, I was, uh, I'm kind of a bit of a nerd. So I, I thought I want to understand this. I want to understand what it is and what's happening. And I started reading and meeting with scientists and really seeing that this wasn't just my problem. Mm. that this was a huge global epidemic and that it had started with uh, men who, after all, have designed our world, although we're working on changing it. <laughs> yes, we are. <laughs> <laughs> basically thinking that the way to succeed is to burn out. You mm-hmm. just power through. You don't really honor your body or your mind I mean, look at the cultural symbols and language we use, you know. You snooze, you lose. Mm. I'll sleep when I'm dead. Mm. I mean, I had dinner with a guy recently who bragged that he had only gotten four hours sleep. And I thought to myself, I didn't say it, but I thought to myself, you know what? If you had gotten five, this dinner would have been a lot more interesting. Oh, so was it a date? No, oh. not a date. <laughs> okay. Just a dinner with a guy who brags because so many people brag about how little sleep they get. I can't get. believe he was telling you that out of anybody. I know, because people are so unconscious. Right, <laughs> right. They want to be like, I don't need five. I don't need sleep. <laughs> so how many hours of sleep are you getting now? So eight. Okay. I get eight, but I want to explain that. Yeah. Basically, the vast majority of people need between seven and nine hours. Like you may be a seven-hour girl, an eight-hour girl or a nine-hour girl. Or you may be in the one and a half percent of the global population that has a genetic mutation. And then you genuinely don't need seven to nine hours. How much sleep do those people need? Well, they may need four hours and be feel great. I am an eight-hour girl. Me too. Thriving! (laughs) <laughs> so, and how do you feel when you get eight hours? I feel great. I wake up on my own. It's either the sun that wakes me up. I wake up before my alarm clock. That's the best. I like to be in bed by 10 p.m. That's when I feel like I'm my best. And what you said is so important. Going to sleep before midnight oh, yeah. is key. Oh, yeah. Because the way your whole body works through the night. Mm-hmm. So what was the first moment? So you've now you've fallen. You went to the doctor. You realized that this is stress or what we now call burnout. Yeah, stress that becomes burnout. And so in this moment, here you are, and you're incredibly successful. You have Huffington Post. But what was the change that you said to yourself, I'm not, this isn't success. This, This isn't what I want. You know, I've always had a spiritual dimension in my life. And I've been very blessed to have had a mother who... I would always say to me, don't miss the moment. She had a lot of little sayings, mm-hmm. you know, angels fly because they take themselves lightly. She was full of little sayings. So I knew that there was another way to live life. What I also realized through studying all this science is that that would also make me more productive and more creative, that there is no trade-off. Mm. That's the most important thing to realize. There's no trade-off between taking care of ourselves and being amazing at work and accomplishing things. In fact, the more we give ourselves the chance to recharge, the better we're going to be at everything we're doing. Because look at what people say that they have their best ideas in the shower, right? Why? Because they're suddenly disconnected from their phones and social media and getting stuff done and their mind can actually receive the best ideas. That's interesting. We just had Megan Trainer on, and she has a new album or a new song out. It's called Genetics. And she said she wrote it in the shower. She was singing in the oh, shower. I and love the that. Whole, the whole song just came out. There she was. And you make a great point. Success is putting everything else down and just focusing on the present. And connecting with yourself, mm-hmm. which leads to, uh, in my book, Thrive, I call it the third metric of success. Which we have right here, because you brought it for me. Thank yes. you. I'm so excited to read this. So it starts with um, me collapsing. But you know there's a happy ending now, so don't worry. Well, because you're here today. <laughs> <laughs> but the whole point of the book is that right now in our culture, we think of only two metrics of success, right. money and status slash power. But this is like sitting on a two-legged stool. Sooner or later, you fall off. Mm-hmm. Unless 
you actually build that third leg, which for me is well-being and health, wisdom. You know, how do we connect with our best ideas, our sense of peace and strength that we all have in us? Wonder, you know, forget to wonder at how amazing life is. You're going to have a baby. I mean, this is so full of wonder. Mm -hmm. And giving, you know, giving is also another part of a full life. You know, it's interesting because I think that a lot of us try to give back in some way. We try to take care of ourselves and like, you know, we'll go to a, a crazy workout class or whatever. But when it comes to wisdom and wonder, those are two new pillars for me that I have to take a step back and say, you know, what do those really mean? And what are what are things that you do in your life that contribute to wisdom and wonder? Well, what is great about you, among many other things, is that you do have a spiritual connection. Yes. And you pray and you sing. And that is a great opportunity to connect us with something bigger than ourselves. Mm -hmm. And for me, wisdom comes from the recognition that we are all part of um, a big universal story. Right. That we are not here like by accident, that there is a blueprint to our lives. We all have a certain destiny we're living out. And when we sense that, it makes us much more accepting of the obstacles and the challenges and the bad things that happen because no life, even the most blessed, doesn't have that. Mm -hmm. and, and it makes us trust the universe. It's, it, must be, it must be very hard to feel that you are living in an indifferent, arbitrary universe. I do feel more trusting of God when I spend time in prayer yes. and meditation. And I mean, I remember when Oprah started bringing in all of this meditation and spirituality into her show. But what happened to you when you started talking like this at the office or with your <laughs> friends? Well, the funniest thing is that I didn't just start talking about it. I started bringing all this coverage into the Huffington Post. Oh. So in 2007, like literally months after I had collapsed, I created a dedicated section at the Huffington Post on sleep. And I remember my board complaining about it because their point was, why is a serious political publication creating a section on something as trivial and irrelevant as sleep? <laughs> and that shows the difference, you know, in the last dozen years because sleep now is covered in the Wall Street Journal, mm -hmm. the impact on leadership, and in the Harvard Business Review, the impact on business productivity. So this has been like a game-changing 12 years. So it's taken 12 years for people to really kind of jump yes. on board, do you think? and also, you know, look at athletes also. They have helped mm. because they, I mean, Andre Ugudala and Kevin Durant are investors in my new company, and they have done a lot to show that recovery is part of performance. It is. It is. Train like an athlete, Train. sleep like an athlete. Exactly. You know, if you, if you have game day, are you going to stay up all night partying? No. no. <laughs> There's also a phone call that you made uh, to Sheryl Sandberg, and she had told you something really interesting, which was... By 2016... Mm -hmm. You know, that was like 11 years being and running the Huffington Post. I just realized I wanted to basically help people lead their lives with less stress and burnout. And I wanted to do it 100%. So this was, you made the phone call to Cheryl when I you were the, ready to leave Huffington. Yeah, I was ready, but but fearful and doubting it, you know. Because there I was, you know, I had built this big global business. I had hundreds of employees around the world. But my heart was telling me that I'm done here, that this is great. It's fantastic. I could spend the rest of my life running it, but I would only make some incremental difference. And I want, my mission now had changed, and my mission was to help the world not go through so much unnecessary pain mm -hmm. around uh, how we live our lives. And, you know, you look at the casualties proliferating, you look at suicides and depression 
and the, the rise of diabetes and heart disease, and they're all connected to stress and burnout. Mm -hmm. Actually, 75% of healthcare problems and healthcare costs. And if you add mental health, 90% are stress and lifestyle related. That is wild. So that's what I wanted to do, but I was also not sure that I was ready. So I called Cheryl Sandberg and I said, you know, I'm kind of agonizing over it. And she said to me, this is not a cost benefit analysis. This is not like a list of pros and a list of cons. She said, close your eyes, listen to your heart, and jump. And you did it. And I did it. And I've never for one second looked back. Did you feel like you succeeded immediately? Did it feel like you were throwing yourself into the lion's den? Well, it definitely felt absolutely right from the minute I did it and announced it. But it's like building a new company. It's like beginning with raising money, uh, hiring employees, uh, mm -hmm. you know, just everything that, that goes into building a company. Mm -hmm. No question, it was much easier the second time because I had already <laughs> had a successful exit. Right. So it was much easier to raise money and it was much easier to have people join. And also, I think we tapped into a moment in our times when people began to feel that something had to change, mm -hmm. when self-care and recharging were beginning to be seen as essential for performance and a fulfilling life. And now there's companies that have, like, nap rooms or quiet yes. rooms. It's incredible how much we have a society great nap has changed. Room. We have employees who are new mothers. Mm -hmm. And... <laughs> you know, with the best intentions. After you come back to work, your baby may have had a bad night and you yeah. didn't sleep well. So you have a nap room for them? We have a nap room for them and a special. The other thing about new mothers, it's very important not just to have a place for them to pump, right. but to have a dedicated fridge. Mm. You know, you may think it's a tiny thing, but breast milk is so precious. Mm. And... I've heard from so many women who say, I don't want to put it in the general kitchen fridge next to the salsa. <laughs> you know, that's my baby's milk. I want a dedicated fridge. So we tried to look at what are the little things that affect women's experience at work. Wow. I didn't even know that that was a thing. I didn't <laughs> think about salsa and breast milk next to each other. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> I'm just like processing breast no, milk and salsa. You need your own little fridge when you're back. I'm also thinking about how I went to bed at probably 2.30 or 3 o'clock last night because I it was a late night. I had a concert and then I just couldn't fall asleep. And, you know, sleep has been different being pregnant. Yes. Oh, let's talk about that. It's interesting because people usually can change only one thing about themselves at a time. And I know that your answer, if I ask you what's that one thing that they should change, is probably going to be sleep. Well, here's what I think. Whatever you decide to change, whether it's sleep or exercise or nutrition, it doesn't matter. Every person needs to make their own decision. But you need to start with micro steps. Micro steps. At Thrive, we, the work we do with companies, on our <clears throat> media platform, the product we've built, the behavior change product, is all based on micro steps. We need to stop making New Year resolutions. I believe that. For it's sure. a disaster. Isn't it? <laughs> Basically, by the middle of January or the third week in January, most people have abandoned them. And what is worse, they feel bad about it. Yeah, and then they get depressed in February. Yes, they feel they have failed. So we believe in what we call micro steps too small to fail. Interesting. Like so small, so tiny that you cannot fail. Like, let me give you an example. How you start your day is as important as how you end your day. So people can say, oh, you need to start your day with 30 minutes meditation. That's hard. <laughs> so we say you need to start your day if you choose to, you know, make that your journey. By taking one minute, 60 seconds, to set your intention for the day, to breathe consciously, 
or to remember what you're grateful for. Mm. Whatever you want to do, but take 60 seconds and do that before you go to your phone. And that 60 seconds will turn into five, will turn into 10, will turn into... But you start with 60 seconds, which changes the quality of the beginning of your day. Because just think of it, 75% of people sleep with their phones by their bed. And the first thing they do before they're fully conscious, before they've gotten out of bed, is get their phone and start looking at texts and emails. And you don't know what you're going to read. Guilty. I am so guilty. (laughs) And it will sometimes change the mood of my day. Exactly. Because suddenly you may have read something that you don't like, and you are not yet ready to deal with it. You're in that a little bit of that in-between state. And so what happens is that your body is flooded with a cortisol stress hormone before you've even fully woken up. So just by taking that one minute which is not bad. If you don't have one minute, you don't have a life, let's face it, right? (laughs) That's true. And at night, you know, when you said um, that last night you... Went to bed late. Went to bed late and you couldn't sleep. Here's what is so important. Creating your own transition to sleep. Mm. Uh, That's another thing we tend to do. We tend to be on our phone until the very last moments, and then we put our phone by our bed, we turn off the light and... We may fall asleep because our bodies are exhausted, but we haven't given our brains the opportunity to turn off off and uh, power down. Mm. But also what I recommend is a little ritual that you create depending on what you want. But Mm -hmm. can I tell you mine? Please, I want to know. So my ritual starts 30 minutes, but start with five, you know? Right. Mine now takes 30 But don't think that yours has to take 30. It starts with my declaring the end of my working day. That's kind of really important because the truth is there is no end Mm -mm. to our working day. No, because we're hustlers. We're hustlers and also we have interesting jobs that we love. Mm -hmm. So it's not like we can say, hey, you know, I have now done absolutely everything I could have done. That's You can never say that, ever. Never. So you declare an end to your working day, and you mark that end by a ritual. The ritual is sacrificing a lamb. No, no. (laughs) (laughs) I'm like, where's the lamb? Where is the lamb? Bring in the lamb. (laughs) No, the ritual is turning off your phone and gently escorting it out of your bedroom. Now, you you literally turn it off? Completely. No airplane mode. No, like, do not disturb. You don't have to turn it off. Okay. Because that was was making me a little anxious. That doesn't matter. You can simply put it on airplane Airplane. mode or simply turn off the Because it's going to be in another room. It doesn't matter. You do whatever you want. You know, this is not like some doctrine. You know. (laughs) (laughs) You must do it this way. You must do it this way. Exactly. I'll send you the instructions. You know. You just, you're going to create your own ritual. I'm just telling you mine. Okay, so the phone goes to bed. The phone goes to bed. You tuck it in. Very important. And then I go and have a hot bath with Epsom salts, a little candle flickering nearby. And I have all my makeup removers laid out by my bathtub so that while I'm in the bath and my brain is beginning to slow down. Decompress. I decompress. I also do something useful because I I can feel you're like me. You want to be productive, like, okay. Yes, what can I be doing right now? What can I be doing right now? And you can be taking your makeup off. Yes, you which is a part of my nightly routine. It is. is very important I, I, for your I, skincare. I do. I have Never a sleep whole with ritual. Bed, with, with your makeup on, right? Never. It doesn't matter how, how many bottles I've had. Or how sexually excited you are. Okay, you oh, can girl, go that... and have sex, but then get up and take your makeup off. Yeah, have okay? sex. And... Major advice for everybody, guys. Don't forget that. Do you hear that? <laughs> have sex and then take your makeup off. Then I, I love beautiful lingerie. Do you like beautiful lingerie? Well, you know, I do, but my husband isn't into... I'm a lingerie designer. I have my own line. Oh, my God. I'm going to check it out right away. We need to get you some. I'm like a major lingerie collector. (gasps) My husband doesn't care about lingerie. But it doesn't matter. It's not for him. It's for you. 
But for me, I just prefer to be naked sometimes. Okay. Well, if you like to sleep naked, that's totally Oh, you okay. sleep in your nice lingerie? I sleep in my silk lingerie. Wait, okay. Do you have like a nighty or a bra? Nighty. Okay, nighty. I sleep, and that's what I mean by lingerie. Okay. You know, nighty. If you don't sleep naked, wear something that's dedicated for sleep. Even if it's a T-shirt, this is your sleep T-shirt, mm. not your going to the gym T-shirt. And on my nightstand is a pile of books that have absolutely nothing to do with work, politics, or anything. They're like novels, poetry, spirituality. And I like to end my day by reading something that's disconnected from mm -hmm. my work. Mm -hmm. And I finish my day by writing down three things I'm grateful for. Oh, that's beautiful. That's beautiful. And then you roll over. And then I roll over and I fall asleep. And my mind has slowed down. I'm not thinking about work. And I, and I remember the blessings in my life. But, you know, start with a tiny part of that. You may want to start with just remembering three things you're grateful for. Mm -hmm. Or having a three-minute shower or bath. It doesn't matter. And then you can keep adding to it. I'm totally doing that tonight. Micro steps. I love that. So Thrive, what Thrive does is the company, your, your company that goes into other companies. Right. That helps them figure out how to be more health conscious. Exactly. And also prove to them that they are also going to be more productive. Got it. That when they take better care of their employees... The performance of the employees in increases. Attrition is reduced. Healthcare costs are reduced. And so they don't have to be nice employers. They just have to be smart and look at the bottom line results. But we also have a media platform. Hmm. And we'd love to invite everybody to tell their stories because we all learn from each other. Yeah, we do. It's about community. It's about community. So we've built this great community on the media platform, which... It's really like the Huffington Post without politics. <laughs> so it doesn't matter where you are on the political spectrum. We want you to come and contribute to this conversation and learn from each other. What are you saying to the companies that aren't doing these things, that aren't implementing health or thrive into their companies? Well, what's happening now, Ashley, is so interesting that especially in the last few months, companies have had... So many incidents of suicides, depression, and anxiety throughout the company that you don't really need to convince them anymore. Mm. They know something has to be done. Oh, wow. So we launched, for example, as well as doing workshops, we have digital programs that are easier to scale across the world mm -hmm. because we are a global company. And we just launched one called Thriving Mind in partnership with Stanford that helps people identify what stresses them and deal with it before it becomes depression and anxiety. Mm -hmm. I want to help people who are depressed and anxious, but I also want to prevent people from becoming depressed and anxious. Hit it before they get there. Yes, and, and what we do is we ask people to identify what biotype they are. Oh, what's we are that? all different biotypes. Let me give you just two. One of them is rumination. The other is negative bias. I mean, I'm a ruminator. I'm working on it. But a lot of women are ruminators, which means we have that voice in our head that replays everything and judges us. Like, before I started working on myself intensely, I would have finished our podcast. Then I would have gotten in my car, and my mind would have started ruminating. Oh, you know, what you said to Ashley about that just really didn't work at all. And then, you know, you forgot to say that. That was the most important thing, and you forgot it. So my mind would go... And like, would spiral. Would spiral. And so while doing the podcast is fun and great, and I live energized, then my mind would just exhaust me. Mm. And so people end up depleted, not because of what they're doing, but what's happening in our minds. Mm. But once you recognize that about yourself, you begin to s create a distance between these thoughts and yourself. That's so interesting. I, Is that in Thrive? Do you talk about that? Yes. Mm -hmm. Oh, and we teach people that. It's not difficult. The first thing is to be conscious of it. We can learn from our mistakes, but that's different than beating ourselves up about our mistakes. That's so true. 
I feel like I'm learning so much right now. I can't wait <laughs> no, to start reading you're a that. Natural. But let me tell you another type is okay. negative bias. Like every life is a mixture, right, of good and bad. But there are people who are all only focusing on the bad. And if you keep focusing on the bad, you are going to become depressed. This is true. <laughs> These are just two types. Got it. So it's like fixing that that thing that you know that's bad about yourself or acknowledging it when it pops up. Acknowledging it. And this is like therapy. It is like therapy, but we want to scale it because not everybody has a therapist. No, not everybody does, and not everybody has the time or the money. Yes. So we want to make it easy. Mm -hmm. Again, micro steps. Micro steps. I'm, micro I'm writing steps. the word micro step down. Isn't it a good word? I think it really because is. Because it immediately takes the pressure off. It does, because I tonight I imagine myself putting my phone in my bed, tucking it in, and going to sleep and, and having a beautiful night's rest. Yes. Now Let's I visualize you having a beautiful night's so rest. So I want to talk about you know, here we are, we're two successful women, and we can create rituals in our lives. And we know that when we go and, and we put our phone away and, and we can go and, you know, have a bath, or I would like to go and just write in my journal. Those are things that, that we've created time for. But the younger generation who's hustling, who's going, who's trying to get to a certain level to feel successful, who don't feel like they can make that time for themselves. You know, what, what is your advice to so them? I am so happy you asked that question because that is the key. What they need to understand is that they're going to be more successful if they learn to put their own oxygen mask on first. Mm. That is like the key. Mm. You know how we talked about micro steps? The other thing we need to talk about is changing your mindset changing false beliefs, which were ra largely created by men. Mm -hmm. You know, the, work, the world of work has been designed by men, and we are now beginning to change it. So the mindset shift has to be recognizing that there is no contradiction, there is no trade-off. When I take care of myself, I'm a much better businesswoman. I come up with better decisions. Just imagine or remember any time you've been exhausted. Mm -hmm. I, let me tell you about myself. When I'm exhausted, and it still happens sometimes because, you know, I have a delayed flight, something, I'm suffering from jet lag, something happens. Let me tell you, I'm a work in progress. There's nothing I'm doing perfectly. So when I'm exhausted and depleted, I'm the worst version of myself. I really kind of don't like myself. I'm less creative. I'm more reactive. I'm more likely to lose my temper. I'm less empathetic. I'm basically not fun to be around. <laughs> <laughs> and that's not good for your career. <laughs> it's not. In it's any not. way. So young people listening who feel like they don't have that time in the day. Make it. Because on the contrary, you don't have the luxury not to make that time for yourself. You make a good point. I wish I would have known that in my I wish I would have 20s, known that. <laughs> in my 20s, period. <laughs> you know, you are a masterful networker. You've created two incredible companies. You've met so many different types of people, the good, the bad, and the ugly. But but what what is it about you that like has kept you from becoming jaded? And, and falling into that lifestyle? I think I love people. I, I love learning from people. I'm endlessly curious. But I also love being by myself. I, I need time by myself. I need time to just read and think and, and just be. Recharge. And recharge. So I think this combination and learning that ebb and flow has been really great because when I show up somewhere, when I show up at work, I want to be fully engaged. You know, Ashley, I spent many, many years just basically going through my to-do list and getting stuff done, and that's no longer enough for me. I don't want just to be effective. I want to be joyful. Mm. And I feel it's such a blessing to be doing what I love to be healthy, uh, you know, to have my family and people I love around me. All these things are incredible blessings. And I don't want to take anything for granted. And I don't want just to check the boxes. To not just be effective, but to be joyful. I think that is a motto for life. I love that. And for me, that's not a barometer. If I'm not joyful, it means 
I'm off course. And, you know, nobody's on course all the time. I'm not on course all the time. But I have now learned how to course correct. Mm -hmm. And incidentally, stress in itself is not the problem. The problem is stress becoming cumulative. Mm. So by the time you go home, you, you're like so wound up. You're so right. You need, you need the calm down. But let me tell you some good news why I'm so optimistic that this is going to work. Share your science, <laughs> science tells us that it takes between 60 and 90 seconds to course correct from stress. That's it? Yes. It takes between 60 and 90 seconds for the stress to get through your whole body and your mind. The rest is just what the mind is doing. Oh, that's so interesting. So we have created, you know, for this behavior change product, a feature called Reset. Okay. So let's say you had some bad news or something happens and you are stressed and you can, you know, how you can feel yes. the stress, right? Yes. You have already sent us the assets that bring you joy. Whatever. Again, very individual. When your baby is born, I'm sure it's going to be pictures of your baby, but it could be a picture of you and your husband that may not be a picture you put on Instagram or that's beautiful, but it means something to you. Mm -hmm. It's just all about what means something to you. Then a picture of a landscape, maybe some of you were that triggered that joy in you. Then a song you love right now, a piece of poetry, a quote. We take all these assets, we animate them, we put them all together. We add a breathing pacer to remind you to breathe consciously. When you're feeling stressed, you play it, 60 seconds. Oh, I can't wait for that. It can totally help you course correct. And then you share your guides, if you want, with people you love. I mean, you'd like to see what has your husband put on. Of course. What have your best friends done? <clears throat> and so it, it reminds us all that we have an opportunity at any moment to choose peace, joy, and strength. At any moment. Hmm. That's beautiful. Wow. I'm just taking in so much. I'm like, I can't wait to dive into the book. Also, there's a quote that you gave when we were at your um, house for the Brita Baby event. And you had said, mother for motherhood. <laughs> when, because I know that you really enjoy being a mom. And I, I love. really love that about you. You're a powerhouse. You're <laughs> just so successful. And then yet you're, you're this thriving mother. And something that you had said was, it's like they take the baby out and put the guilt back in. And at the time, I couldn't tell you I was pregnant, but I was taking so many mental notes, <laughs> so many. And I want to know if you can just expand on that, because I'm walking into motherhood, and I keep thinking about this guilt, this mom guilt that everybody keeps talking about. And I don't want that to be an extra yes. pressure added in my life. So here's what I learned, that working moms carry that guilt unnecessarily through our lives. And we need to kind of remind ourselves that working doesn't make us less of a good mom mm. because anything that fulfills us makes us a better mom. Mm -hmm. We need to remind us of that. And for me, it's like when I realized that, it changed so much about my relationship with my children. And you figure out how you want to navigate that relationship. But let's throw away the guilt. It's so unnecessary and so depleting. Mm. So let's all forgive ourselves. We've I mean, done it's the crazy. Best. I haven't even had this kid yet. And you're I, already guilty. Yeah. <laughs> I'm already thinking about the guilt that I'm going to have. It's just, it's wild. <laughs> it's wild. And I don't want it. And so I'm taking advice from mothers everywhere on how to so prevent great. it. When we give advice, we also remind ourselves. Mm -hmm. This is the biggest thing that I've learned too, is yes. talking about your own story, the things that you've gone through, and I think that's why Thrive has been thriving. What's one of the biggest lessons that you learned from your mother? So the biggest lesson actually was around failure. My mother used to say, Failure is not the opposite of success. It's a stepping stone to success. Mm. And she always made, I mean, I grew up in a one-bedroom apartment who had no money. And my mother always made us feel bigger than our circumstances, not limited by our circumstances. I was like um, coming back from school 
in Athens, Greece, where I was brought up. And I saw a picture of Cambridge University in a magazine. And I got home and told my mom, I want to go there. And everybody else I said that to said, don't be ridiculous. You know, you don't speak English. We have no money. And it's hard for English girls to get into Cambridge. My mother said, let's see how you can go there. <laughs> And at the same time, she didn't make me feel that if I didn't go there, my life was over. Mm. So it became this adventure where we, I learned English and I applied for a scholarship. And bottom line, I got into Cambridge, but it wasn't like this is the be, what do you end call it? End all be all. Be yes, <laughs> I know what you're saying. This isn't the end all be all. Exactly. And so that's the biggest lesson she gave me. That's beautiful. That's beautiful. And I'm sure you implemented that in raising your daughters. Yes. I also made my, and, and the book I wrote on Becoming Fearless was also to help them take risks and choose to do something even while they were afraid. Mm. I say in the book that fearlessness is like a muscle. Mm -hmm. The more you exercise it, the stronger it gets. Fearlessness is like a muscle. Ariana. <laughs> what are you studying right now? Because you're you're a master student. I'm a student. I'm yes. a lifelong student. What are you studying right now? So here's what I'm studying right now. One of the hardest things has been helping people change behavior. Mm -hmm. That's my mission right now. That's what I'm studying. How can we help people go from awareness to action? And what I'm hearing from a lot of the scientists I'm learning from is that we need not just to give people micro steps and nudges, but to also touch their hearts. Mm. And that's where ancient wisdom and spiritual traditions come in. We want to help people understand that there is something deeper in ourselves and that it's our birthright to connect with that. So that's what you're studying right yes. now. And how to do it. How to because I always like to study in a way that I can then give live back and teach. to people. Yes. That's great. So what are you doing now with Thrive? What's next for Thrive? So we're working with PNG to bring our platform to consumers. Because here's another irony. One of the fastest ways to change habits is to add them to existing habits. So let's say you're brushing your teeth morning and night while you're brushing your teeth. Remember three things you're grateful for. Oh. You know, like, let me give you another example. You have, um, I read somewhere that you have... Uh, Affirmations that you use. Exactly. You wash your hair. While you are washing your hair, do your affirmation. That's great. And it's also a great use of time. It's a great use of time. You're not adding time. What do most people do when they wash their hair? They worry. <laughs> they worry. They overthink things. They overthink things. Yeah, you're they right. They ruminate. I process. You process. Instead, you know, just use that time to leave the shower feeling empowered. I'm going to leave the shower feeling empowered. Exactly. Look, leave the shower feeling empowered. <laughs> Thank you so much for being here Thank today. Thank you so much. I feel like I could talk to you for another half Me hour. Too. But you I, have the best eyes. You're so present. Oh, well, so are you. You're really listening. Thank you so much. I'm listening because this is something that's important to me. I think that burnout culture is real. A lot of people my age. I'm 31, and I think that there's a lot of hustle and go, go, go. And and there really is something to the third metrics that you that you talk about. And I think that it's important to implement into your life. Thank you so much. Thank I you. loved it. Yeah, me too. So we do one thing yes. at the end of every Pretty Big Deal, mm -hmm. and it's kind of a lightning round. Yes. And I just need you to fill in the blank. Great. Okay. So first is, I pretty much always say... Yes to cheese. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. <laughs> What's the biggest lesson you've learned this year? Uh, the biggest lesson I learned is not to be so anxious when my daughters did not immediately uh, respond to a text. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to take that note as well for myself and my new baby. Okay. Well, we're, we're going to have a while until they're texting. <laughs> What's the biggest deal you've ever made? The biggest deal was having the courage to leave Half Post and start Thrive. That's a pretty big deal. And we know that you're a pretty big deal, but what's a pretty big deal to you? A pretty big deal to me is to help people 
realize that we have that place of strength, peace, and wisdom in us. It is our birthright, and we can reach it anytime we choose. Beautiful. Ariana Huffington. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Can't wait to welcome baby to the world. Me neither. All right, guys. Thank you so much for joining Pretty Big Deal today. We want to hear from you on Instagram and Twitter, so make sure you leave your questions, your comments. You never know if we're going to read them right here. Me and Ariana. See you guys. Bye.